Hallelujah. I know that the Lord is already on the move this morning. And there's nothing like being in the presence of God. Nothing. <laughs> there is nothing like a touch of heaven here on earth. And I thank the Lord that he went to Calvary to make a way Amen. that we can Amen. remain in his presence, Amen. that we can dwell in his presence. And the presence of God that we felt this morning can be an everyday, all day event. We can constantly stay in the presence of God. Amen. And the message that I have for you this morning is the rebuilding of the temple. The title of my message this morning is the rebuilding of the temple. Of the temple. Yes, Lord. And I'm coming from the book of Ezra, chapter 3. The book of Ezra, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And the scripture reads And when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of, I might butcher these names, I'm sorry, Jozarak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. If you will travel down to verse 10 with me. Ezra chapter 3 verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set their priests in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to the praise of the Lord, and after the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And I believe that that's what we were doing this morning. We were giving praise, we were giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is good. Whatever you're facing this morning, I want to tell you that he is good. For his mercy endures how long? Forever. Forever toward Israel. Forever towards you. You can put your name there. This is a personal message for you this morning. His mercy endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. Naya, the Lord's going to restore your shout this morning. She said last night she had a little shout. This morning I'm believing that God is going to restore our shout this morning. And when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. The foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Hallelujah. This book, I'm going to travel through this quickly. The background of this book was written by Ezra, who was a priest. And his name meant Yahweh helps. And I don't know about you this morning, but that song was singing that, I, that we need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Every hour, I need you, Lord. I need you to come. I need your presence. I need your grace. I need your power. I need you, Lord. And then, then his name meant Yahweh helps. And I believe that the Holy Ghost wants me to tell you this morning that he's here to help. He's here to help. He's here to come alongside you. He's here to be with you every single step of the way. And this man who was a priest... This was a man after the word of God. And I want to follow this pattern because that we should be this like this man. A woman or a man after the word of God. That we should not only know the word of God and read the word of God, but we should put into practice the word of God. This man, Ezra, he was a man of the law. He was a man of the word, but he put into practice what he read. But not only that, he taught the word of God. 
So we should, through our lives, be teaching the Word of God. We should be teaching it to our children. We should be teaching it to one another. The Bible says to esteem one another, to come alongside one another, and to even teach one another the Word of God. And this man did that. He also, this book is an emphasis of the priest, but he was an eyewitness of what took account. He was there. He was there in the book of Ezra. He was there. He's seen what God had did. He's seen where the children of Israel were at. He's seen what God had promised. And he's seen the promise come to pass. Amen. And this book was written when the children, after the children of Israel came out of exile. So I'm going to paint a picture for you. The children of Israel, they were disobedient. <laughs> and they were worshiping idols. And God told them that he was going to allow King Nebuchadnezzar to come along and Babylon to come along and to take them captive. When we worship idols, idols meaning anything that we place before God, anything that is more important to us in our relationship with God, God will allow us to become captivated by that thing. He will allow that thing to arrest us, to teach us a lesson. And not because he doesn't love us, but because he does love us. And that's what was happening here. The children of Israel, they were living in doubt and unbelief. They were placing other things before the Lord. And he allowed them to be taken captive. And he told them, he warned them, this is going to be what happens. And they were taken captive by Babylon. How many of us have been in a situation before where whatever it is that we've been placing before the Lord, that when it comes to captivate us, it's not a good captivation. It's usually very hostile, and we have to deal with the consequences of being captivated by that thing. Well, Babylon was a hostile nation, so they were trying to hold on to the children of Israel. But God promised. That he was going to bring his people out of captivity. So God doesn't allow us to become captivated or to be taken captive without promising us a way of escape. Amen. Amen. He's always going to give us Hallelujah. a way of escape. Hallelujah. And in this book, Jeremiah, 160 years before this took place, prophesied that this would happen. That tells me that God knows exactly what is going on in our lives and exactly what's going to happen and exactly the time that it's going to happen. And he promises us that he's going to be there for us. He promises us that he's going to make a way of escape. So in this book is during a time that the remnant is returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. And I believe that we are in a season as a church that God's remnant is returning to the Lord. Yeah. I believe that God is going to allow things to happen in our nation. But while things are crumbling, right, he right. is rebuilding Amen. his Amen. temple. Yes, he yeah. is rebuilding I, his I people. Yes, he yes. is calling us back to the altar and the altar was a place where their sacrifice was made and Jesus Christ Amen. is Amen. our sacrifice Hallelujah. he is calling us back to himself we were telling the teenagers last night they were all sitting in this front row and I had them take just one step forward yeah. just one step the Lord's calling us just to take one step toward them he's calling us to come whatever has been separated us, maybe from his presence, I'm asking you this morning to take one step towards the altar, take one step towards the sacrifice, because he already did it, and when we take that step, the grace of God will envelop us, the grace of God will come, and he will begin to work on us, he's calling us out of a place of captivity as a people of God, even though things might crumble around us, even though the storms might come, you you don't have to be held captive by the storm in your life. You don't have to be held captive by this nation and the things that are going on. We can be free in Christ. We are free in Christ. And he is calling us as a people.
to the altar, even in, when the enemy has surrounded us. The main purpose of this book is to talk about the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and that God gave a covenant to his people and he keeps his word and he keeps his covenant and he is building up a people of worship and prayer, worship and prayer. Listen, church, we're going to have to learn how to be a people of worship and prayer in hard times. Yes. We got to be a people that yes. press in and know how to worship and pray. If things go in a direction that we're not ready for, we better be a people that learn how to touch heaven and worship and pray. When things get, if things get shut down, we better be a people that know how to touch heaven and worship and pray because God is gonna reveal himself as healer, sustainer, provider, protector, the savior of man. He is gonna be that and he's gonna make himself real in our lives. But what do we need to do as the children of God, as a people of God? Point people to the altar. We need to run to the altar ourselves. Of where the sacrifice is. That's the only way. Naya cracked me up this morning when she was telling me what was going on last night walking around this church, the walls of Jericho. And the first thing out of my mouth was, did God tell you to do that? And she was like, no. <laughs> and, then, and then she made me laugh because she forgot the count. And she said she did extra. <laughs> but how many times do we do that? Oh, how many times do we say, okay, God, your sacrifice is enough, but let me add some of this to it. Right, right. Let me do a little extra to help you along with my deliverance. Mm -hmm. Let me do a little extra to help you along with providing for me. Let me do a little extra. And God told her, go sit down and receive. Yeah. See, God has already made a way and he just wants you to receive the freedom. Amen. Receive the provision. Amen. Receive the deliverance. Receive what he has already given to you. And I believe that God wants to build up his people in this hour, in this very time, because others that do not know him need to see a temple of praise. They need to see a temple of worship. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We are the church of God. If this building is no longer here, we still are the church. Amen. Amen. We should still be filled with grace. We should still be filled with power. We should still be filled with worship. If we have to worship in the parking lot, we should still be filled with praise and worship. If we, we got to meet in a house, we should still be filled with praise and worship. God wants to build a people of praise and worship, but built on the proper foundation. Right, right. And we, when we don't build on the proper foundation and we're looking at our circumstances or our own self to get us through, guess what? We're not going to have a praise. Right. We're not going to have a praise and we're not going to have worship in our heart. Because we're not going to see any way out. Right. But when we look at the goodness of God, when we look at the faithfulness of our God, when we believe and stand on the word of our God and what he has said in our word, it produces a worship. It produces a praise. It produces a great yeah, shout. Yeah. See, Naya was looking at herself walking around the walls of Jericho saying, how can I get these walls down? And it produced no shout whatsoever. Yeah. But when God, when we look at the greatness of our God, yeah. we're, it's going to produce a shout in our heart. And guess what? It might not be a shout that comes out of your mouth, but you ever just think about the Lord, the yes. goodness of the Lord, and it begins to stir faith in your heart. And you begin to feel his presence. And there's a shout going on inside. Amen. It might not be coming out yet, but there's a stirring and there's a shout coming and coming from our faith in Christ. That's it. See, to rebuild means that something has been damaged. Something has been destroyed. Something in our lives need to be restored or reconstructed. How many times? I mean, we're under construction, y'all. Right. We are under construction of the Holy Ghost. And he wants to rebuild and restore his people. The setting of this story begins in Ezra 1.1. You can put it on the board if you'd like. 
And I, I know that I like to go through the setting, and I usually end up preaching from the setting, not as like Angela always, but it's so good. And it's okay if I stay there for a second. Ezra 1 1, it says, Now, in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up in the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, I want to stop there for a moment. King Cyrus was a heathen king. And he was named Cyrus the Great. And I love this because it says that the Lord stirred the spirit. And Cyrus, that, mean, that word stirred means was awakened. A heathen king. That tells me that God can change the heart of a king. Yeah. That God can soften the heart of the hardest of kings, the hardest of men. If you feel like something is too far gone or too far lost, God was able to soften and speak to the heart of a Persian king. And he was the great. That means that he conquered many, 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 many lands. This man had no need, so to say, for God. But the Holy Spirit began to deal with this king. But what I love about this is that King Cyrus was ordered to be killed when he was younger by his grandfather, who had a dream that one day Cyrus would exceed his grandfather and take the throne. Who does that sound like? I think it sounds like Moses. <laughs> it sounds like Jesus. And God had a plan to use this heathen king to let the children of Israel go free. Amen. Amen. So what did God do? He was ordered to be killed, and the officer that was supposed to kill him hid him amongst the shepherds. Wow. I was like, wow, Lord, even when he was younger, you had your hand upon him wow. because you knew the plan was he would become ruler and king of Persia. He would be a great influence amongst the nations. And you were going to use this man to set Israel free. Wow. And God's hand was upon him the whole time. The officer, he could have lost his life for hiding him. But God's hand was upon this man. Why? Because there was a divine plan right. for the children of Israel. Wow. That shows me that God is in ultimate control of all things. And his hand is upon your life. It's upon your children's lives. It's upon our family's lives. His hand is upon this nation. He was the king of many nations. And Cyrus ended up being ruler, a legendary ruler of this world. He was known for his mighty exploits. And he, but he was remembered the most for his policies of peace, setting Israel free. Wow. Setting Israel free. And what I, I loved about this was, it, so many different scholars say many different things, but somewhere along the line, Queen Esther who we know went into the king's courts and said, if I perish, I perish. And God used her to set Israel free as well. But she had a huge influence upon King Cyrus's life. Oh, wow. So if you don't think that when you bring your children to church or to those who you speak on the job with, right. that you're not having an influence, maybe you don't see it right now. Right. Maybe you don't see the family member that you've been ministering to right now. I mean, could you imagine Esther's thoughts as King Cyrus was growing up and she had poured into him and watched him become the heathen king of Persia and say, man, all that I had spoken, all that I had said, but all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit begins to move on King Cyrus's heart, that's when things begin to open up. 
And not only that, but Daniel's prophecies were shown during that time as well. And the scripture reads, and the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah was fulfilled. Well, what was being fulfilled? Jeremiah 29 10 says, for thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. This was 200 years before King Cyrus was raised up to where he was. 200 years before Jeremiah is prophesying, saying this is going to happen to the children of Israel, but I'm going to raise up a king that is going to set my people free, and I'm going to use a heathen king at that. God can use anyone to accomplish what he has set out to do. And that word says, I will visit you. That word visit means that in the midst of your captivity, I am going to come and visit and care for you in a friendly manner. That means that the Spirit of God was coming to visit. If you feel like you're in some sort of captivity this morning, the Lord says, I have come to visit you. I am your friend. I have come to assist you. I have come to be there for you. And not only will I visit you, but I will perform. That word perform meaning accomplish. I'm going to make it clear. I'm going to confirm. I'm going to continue what I already started to do in you. I'm going to make this decree and I'm going to cause you to get up and rise. That means I'm going to cause you to get up and rise in the midst of your ashes, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your captivity, in the midst of your pain. I'm going to cause you to get up and rise. My spirit's going to visit you and I'm going to cause you to get up. He's going to do it. We don't have to do it. All we got to do is take one step toward the altar. All we have to do is look back to the sacrifice. See, this was all about returning God's people to the altar, returning God's people to the sacrifice. And they prophesied it 200 years before they seen it come to pass. The word of God says that he had stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation. That proclamation means to cry out with a loud voice throughout all his kingdom, and he put it in writing. That means the spirit of God awakened the heart of Cyrus and opened up his eyes to some spiritual truth. He gave him supernatural wisdom and supernatural understanding. And that's what we need. We need eyes to see the kingdom of God. We need eyes to see the glory of God. And the only way to do that is to be born again. And the proclamation of Cyrus went out. And I love this. That word proclamation is an announcement. There was an announcement from heaven. God is making an announcement from heaven in this time, I believe. Right now in this season of our lives to the church. And what was that proclamation? King Cyrus stands up and he says, The Lord God of heaven and earth has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. King Cyrus, he doesn't say... I have built. He said, God has given me. He acknowledges the Lord and says, God has given me all these kingdoms. But he also says, why? He says, God has given me these kingdoms. Why? To build a house in Jerusalem. Cyrus knew that it was all about restoring the temple of God, rebuilding the temple of God. And in this season, I'm believing that God is rebuilding his people to show his glory on this earth. He is taking us out of captivity, his church, and those that are lost, and he wants to rebuild a temple of worship and a temple of praise. Despite what's going on around us. Amen. And he said, God has given me this position and he has given it to me ultimately that he has given it to me, rebuild the temple. And I want to say this, that God was in full control 
Because the book of Daniel 2.21 says that he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. And he gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So guess what, y'all? That tells me that in this season that we're living in even right. now, right. God knows how to raise up nations. Right. He knows how to bring down nations. Right. He knows how to raise up leaders. He knows how to bring up down leaders. He knows exactly what is going on, and it is to why rebuild his people. That's it. He That's is it. putting us in a position in the church in this season to be a temple of his glory, his worship, and his praise. He wants to release his people from captivity. Release means to set free, to remove burdens, to remove oppression, and to remove the care from your shoulders. He wants to release you yes. this morning yes. from everything that you have been carrying, from everything that you have been laboring for, yes. from everything that has been weighing you down this morning. He has come to rebuild you, yes. not you yourself. He has come. His spirit has come this morning to do the work that he proclaimed all that long ago. He is doing it again. God does things, if you ever read in, in the Bible, in a pattern. He always does it the same way. And it starts at the altar. It starts at the sacrifice. Ezra 1 3 says, Who is there among you? All his people. His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. So that tells me, what is the mission? Build the house of God. What is the mission? We should be going out and telling people about Jesus and telling them what he has done for us and showing them what God can do for them. Because what is the mission? Right. To build the temple of God. To build the kingdom of God. That is our mission here on earth. If a, if a heathen king could get that message, why can't we? Right. Why, can't, why do we get so comfortable and we're not wanting to build. We're not wanting to build the kingdom of God. Not wanting to build our households. Not wanting to come to the altar. Not wanting to press in and pray. Not wanting to press in and worship. Not wanting to allow the surrendering and allowing the spirit of God to build us. That we could go out and do the mission which God has called us to do. What was it to rebuild the temple. <clears throat> that word build means to make, to repair, and to set up for success. The cross has already made a way for you. It's already made a way. You already have the success plan. It's right there. It's at the altar. That was the success plan. And what does it say? It says, Ezra 1, 4. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of this place help him with silver, gold, and goods, and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. I thought this was really cool, because not only is he setting you free, but he's going to provide the means in which you need to get the job done. He provided silver, gold, beasts from his own treasury. So how much more will God provide for you in time of need? He provides everything that you need. Gold, silver, every finances, provision, whatever you need this morning, it's already been provided. All we need to do is come and receive it. I thought that was amazing how King Cyrus, the Spirit of God moved on him and by free will, he said, here's a bunch of goods from the treasury. Think about that. 5,400 pieces of gold and silver he gave to the children of Israel for the mission of God. He was a heathen. <laughs> he wasn't even saved. And the Spirit of God opened up his eyes to provide for the people of God. That amazes me. Wow. That God would see fit to send this man and to give. He had the means to give. I thought about this. How much more as we as the children.
children of God should we want to give? I'm not here to talk about tithes and offerings or anything like that. But I'm just talking about, in general, how much more of our time? How much more of our servitude? Okay, yeah, our finances. Yeah. Okay, then these were free will offerings. A free will offering means that King Cyrus had the ability to reject what the Spirit of God was saying. How many times has the Lord moved on our heart and told us to go do something and we can either receive it or we can reject it? Go give someone a, a hug or whatever the case may be. Give someone this or that. And we reject or receive what God is saying to us. How much more if somebody says, why don't you go help the kids one day? Or why don't you go help Hannah clean the church one day? Or why don't we go and visit that brother or sister who we haven't seen in church? Right. And, and we say, oh, we're too busy. Or, oh, but this heathen king could give up of all his treasuries and beasts. Why? To rebuild the temple? That amazes me. That, that someone that wasn't even saved was willing to give all this for the work of God. How much more should we? So God gives us a free will. That still tells me that we have the ability to choose whether or not we want to receive the Spirit of God and what God wants to do in our lives or reject it. But what was the ultimate outcome of King Cyrus receiving the Word of God? It was the rebuilding of the temple. God wanted to rebuild the temple. And I love this in Isaiah 44, 28. It says that saith Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Listen to this. Isaiah 44, 28, 160 years before. Isaiah says that saith Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shall be built and to the temple and thy foundation shall be laid. 160 years before the word of God came forward and said by his name. Wow. And how many times we think God doesn't even know what's going on in our lives? How can God provide for me? He knew King Cyrus by name 160 years before he was even going to be king. And God knew that he was going to use him. So how much more does God know what he's going to do with our lives? So we see in Ezra chapter 3 verse 1, now the restoration of worship. See, God had his hand. He was playing it out. His plan was being laid out before the foundation of time. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And he knows what he's going to do with you. And he knows what he's doing with this nation. And he knows what he's doing with our church right here. And he knows what he's doing with the grand scheme of the church too. And it says in the book of Ezra 3, 1, And when the seventh month was come... And the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. As one man to Jerusalem. So I looked up here. What is the importance of the seventh month? This all has to do with the re restoration of the worship of the people of Israel. What does this mean? This means that the book of the law and the Levitical law said this. In the seventh month, which says to be the month of October, there is three different feasts. One of the feasts was the Feast of the Trumpets. The Feast of the Trumpets was ten days of all of the atonement. That tells me they spent ten days drawing near to God. Ten days drawing close to Him. Ten days wanting to be in His presence. Ten days standing in all the atonement of what so there's a drawing there's a drawing right now the spirit of God yeah. is drawing his people yeah. back to him back to the sacrifice but look everything might go and guess what all we're gonna have left is Jesus yeah. Yeah. all we're gonna have left is the blood of Jesus all we're gonna have left is the word of God and it said that they all went together as one right Right. We're going to need each other. Amen. We're going to have to stand with each other. All drawing where? Drawing near to him. Focusing back to him. I believe that God wants to renew and restore the focus of the church. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. wants to restore where we've been looking. It's not in plans, agendas. <laughs> it's not in all these things that we can do even though fellowships are nice. But it's in restoring our focus back on Jesus, that's back it. on the blood, back on the atonement, yeah. because that's where the Spirit of God can move yeah. and operate yeah. and have His way in our lives. That's 
I believe that God wants us to refocus and draw to him. That means he wants your 100% undivided attention. He doesn't want you to be divided in your heart at all. Let go, surrender, and take one more step towards the altar. That's it. Take one more step towards the altar. And this time was a place of sacrifice on the altar and their undivided attention. On day 10, it was the atonement. That means there was a Sabbath rest. Everybody was forbidden to work on this day. And that tells me that you can rest. As you draw near to God, That's you can it. rest. As you refocus That's back it. on the blood, you can yeah. rest. When you come towards him, you can rest. Why? Because he's already done it. You can rest in his presence. But on that day of atonement, I found it interesting. As the priests were going in to offer up the sacrifice, they didn't just wash their hands and feet. They washed their whole body before they went in. And I was like, wow, Lord, I find that interesting. There is a complete separation that God wants us as a people of God to have. Not just a little bit. Wow. Okay, Lord. <laughs> he wants a complete separation. All of you. Mind, body, soul, spirit, eyes, ears, mouth, everything that you, your heart, and it's so prone to wander, prone to leave the God that I love. Restore it back, Lord Jesus. He wants a whole separation and a whole washing. Let him wash over us. And then it says they didn't just wear the normal robe they had on. They wore a special robe as they were going to go back in to the holies of holies. Take off the garment of heaviness. Put on the garment of praise. Take off the old man. Put on the new man. When it says the new man, that's like a garment. You're putting on a garment of the new man. I am new. I am dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not but Christ who lives in me put on the new man because the only way that you can go into the holies of holies is being separated and clothed in the blood of Jesus Christ and that's when we can enter into his presence that's when we can have a heart of worship because it doesn't matter about what we've done anymore it only matters about what he's done when we put on Jesus it's all about him and what he's already done for us hallelujah and then when they do that he has the sensor in his hands, and it's filled with live coals. Live, that word live stuck out to me. He wants a living church. <laughs> he wants a church that's alive, that's full of power, that's full of praise, that's full of worship. Why? Because I put on the new man, and I can have a garment of praise now. Because I'm looking at him. I'm refocused on him. I'm aligning myself with him. I'm separated unto him. And now I can go in to the holies of holies. And there was incense on the coals. Incense is a, is a um, prayers of the saints that go up. And that tells me he hears our cry. Yeah. When we're alive in a living church, he hears the cry of his people. He hears the cry of his saints. And then they go and they, they slay um, an animal, a sacrifice for the atonement of the priesthood. But then they go and they and they slay a male goat. And you know what? After that, this was interesting. After that, they take a live goat. Okay, they offer a sacrifice, a pure sacrifice on the altar, blood, right? But then they take a live goat and they have somebody come and lay hands on the goat. And then it's like an identification that my sins are forgiven. But then they let the goat go in the wilderness. That the sins which you have committed are now gone away from you. You identify with the sacrifice, the blood offering. I am free. And now those identify with Christ. And now those sins are gone. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, I'm trying to get you. This is where the Lord wants us to be. He wants to be us a church that is built on the blood of Jesus, identifying with the sacrifice and what he has done. And now it's washed away. It's under the blood. I don't care if you committed it five seconds ago. You can refocus. You can realign. You can look. 
look back to him, identify with him, and now it's gone. That's it. That's beautiful. Amen. Yes. Mm. It's beautiful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then they take the remains and they take it outside the city and they burn it all. Burn it up, Lord. Everything that's not of you. And then on the 15th day, they have the Feast of Tabernacles. I thought this was cool, too. So we're all, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to see what was going on the seventh month. What was going on in the seventh month that this was so important to the Lord to put it in the Bible? Look at everything that's going on wow. in the seventh month. And then it said, the Feast of Tabernacles. This was an ingathering of labor. This was where they had booths set up. And I thought this was cool. These booths were constructed of branches of trees, hiding in the cross of Christ, dwelling in this booth. And what did this represent? This was a joyful reminder to Israel of God's protection, preservation, and shelter from all storms. Amen. 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 They dwelled in these booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, to remind you that you have protection preservation and shelter from all storms and guess how many days they dwelled there seven i thought that was so cool i don't know about you but i like this kind of stuff because i just see jesus's fingerprints yeah. all over yeah. it yeah the seventh day of protection i mean um, um preservation and protection that means it's a perfect work and they're dwelling where? In these branches. And I just see the cross. <laughs> Dwell in the protection of the cross. Dwell there. And that's where God can meet us. And it lasted 22 days. These, fest these festivals lasted 22 days. So I believe that God wants us as believers to follow the pattern. Follow the pattern. Separate ourselves unto him. Clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. Offer up praise unto our God. Dwell in where the secret yes. place is. Remain there and allow him to move. And what? There should be a joy that's produced yes. in the heart of a believer yes. that remembers what Christ has done for them. That's it. When we look at ourselves, all you're going to see is a hot mess. Mm -hmm. So Ezra 3.2 says... And then stood up Yeshua and the son of Jezrak and his brother and the priests and Zerubbabel. I like that name, Zerubbabel. And the son of Shatil and his brethren and built, I want you to focus on this, builded the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it was written in the law of Moses. Before they laid the foundation, they built the altar. Before we can even have a foundation in Christ, we need to come through this sacrifice. That's it. We need to yeah. come to the altar. Amen. We need to come to the blood of Jesus. And that burnt offering was a sin offering that restored right relationship with God. Restored communion with God. Restored fellowship with God. So if you feel, or I feel, or we feel as a church that we're, where is God now? Where is he now? What? I'm too far from him. I messed up too much. I doubted him too much. I'm in this captivity of my own mind and my own emotions and my own storm. God says that there was a burnt offering named Jesus Christ, a sin offering that was offered up for you and I to restore relationship, to restore fellowship, to restore communion. That means that you can hear from God and we can hear from him and he can hear from us. There is a relationship that is restored at the altar of God. He said that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have been called out of darkness. Why? To praise him. You have been called out of your old life. Why? To praise him, to worship him, to show that he's worthy. He's worthy, and he is calling us back to 
to the altar. Yeah. He's calling us back, church, to a place of communion with him. That's it. I believe that he wants to restore our communion with him more than ever before. Yeah. He wants to remove everything out of our lives that is standing in the way of us and him. Yeah. He is bringing us back to a place of constant communion. And I'm going to say this. This burnt offering was offered up morning and night. Morning and night, morning and night, morning and night. So that tells me God wants a constant communion with us. Morning and night, go to the altar. Morning and night, go to Jesus. Morning and night, go through the blood of Jesus. And it, it said in the scripture that it is written that all brethren, all brethren, and that tells me every race, every ethnicity, young old, male, female, doesn't matter your economic status, doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter what you did or didn't do, it doesn't matter. All can come. That's it. All can come. And it is written in the law of Moses. And I'm believing that, that God has already laid it out for us. Naya, if you would come back. God has already laid it out for us that the restoration of the temple of God, the restoration of his people starts at the altar. It starts at the altar. And it said that he had laid a foundation in the temple by his builders. You and I are his builders. You and I are the ones that should be pointing people to Jesus and what he has already accomplished for us. He wants to build his temple and by his spirit. And, that, and that's what I said in the beginning. Sabrina, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Pam, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Michelle, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wade, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I believe that God wants to rebuild us. He wants to, everything that has been destroyed, if our faith has been damaged, if our faith has been dwindling, I believe that today is a day that God wants to begin to rebuild. And what do we need to do? Come back to the altar. Come back to his word. Come back to what he has said. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you could all stand, please. I don't know what you've been facing. I don't know what you have been going through. But the word of God says that he is good and that his mercy endures forever. And all the people let out a great shout. When the temple was being rebuilt, when it came up after the altar and the foundation was being laid, there was a restoration taking place. And I'm asking you, if you need to be restored in any way, if you feel like there, there's an area of my life and I just need God to touch it, I just need God to show me his glory in this area again, I need God to come and to rebuild that which was being destroyed in my faith or damaged or maybe you're going through some pain and God, you just want God to show up and re begin to rebuild and focus 